is my pleasure and privilege to start the Forum on Human Solidarity on behalf of Dr. Wale Endar, Secretary General of Habitat II, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and all those who have worked very, very hard to make this event the obvious great success, the fact that you've all turned up on a Saturday morning. My name is Peter Overlander, and I was entrusted with the task of coordinating this forum on human solidarity. The idea was Dr. Endars to attempt to introduce a different dimension into the ongoing process of Habitat II, to add to the continuing and continuously evolving idea of how to improve human settlements, or if you're searching for a single word, how to make the settlements not just human but humane, to improve the quality of life, particularly for all those who are not able to help themselves very easily. We are, in a sense, entering an experiment in attempting to add to the general discussion about improving human settlements by focusing on the spirit of women and men throughout the world. Because we all know that bricks and mortar, by themselves, of themselves, do not build communities. Yes, we need more housing and better transportation and better infrastructure and more open space and better education and a whole lot of other things that you are very familiar with. We have to guard against the destruction of the environment. We have to improve it. But beyond all that is the spirit of women and men, and that is beyond bricks and mortar. The Forum on Human Solidarity is trying to explore language which will allow us to broaden and widen and deepen the commitment we all have to improve human settlements because ultimately it's the quality in these settlements which will enable those who live in these various communities, large and small, to commit themselves to contribute to that improvement. We have to find ways and means of enabling those who are usually called the consumers to become the producers, because without the personal commitment and the continuing involvement of those who live and work and play in the communities that we call human settlements, these settlements will never be the full fulfillment that they could be. We all know that there is something called genius loci, the genius of the place in which we chose to live. Here we're trying to find words and language which will allow us to find a addition to the discussion and go beyond statistics, beyond numbers, beyond quantity. It is my privilege and pleasure to ask Dr. Wally Endow, the Secretary General of Habitat II, to address us and to give us the charge which will allow us to in fact fulfill the nature of the program, a spontaneous conversation. We are privileged to have with us a spectacular array of world thinkers and leaders who will discuss amongst themselves with the help of a remarkable moderator and we are privileged to listen in. This is meant to be truly a conversation in which we are party to the evolution of ideas. This is not a scripted program. It is an experiment in attempting to elicit new ideas, new guides from thoughtful people so that we can move into the 21st century with confidence and ensure that the human settlements are truly humane. Dr. Wally Endow, the person who had the idea to convene this forum and to whom we are deeply grateful for that leadership. Dr. Endow. Thank you so very much, Peter. One uh, fact that I try often to convey 
is that uh, this Habitat 2 process has benefited from the best advice, both spiritual and intellectual, than any conference that I know in the United Nations history. Peter Oberlander, our friends, many, many friends, who have spared no effort to help me carry this load which needed such heavy lifting to help me have the vision and the confidence and the spiritual engagement perhaps that it takes, however modest on my part, to be able to, alongside with you, hand in hand with all of you, to engage this process. Thank you, Peter. Many persons and organizations, and certainly our host country, and let me turn immediately to Mr. Yid Guluxus, Seguriel Tuzun, who have been in the trenches with us for the past two and a half years, engaged, committed, purposeful, delivering their side of the bargain and doing more than that, making sure that the facilities and the atmosphere that this wall conversation, Habitat II, required to deliver its promise. They are the reasons, finally, for this success. Ladies and gentlemen, let me request you to give us a round of applause for our host country leaders who have made Habitat II possible. A very special thanks, however, goes to our friends, our friends Jane and George Russell for their most generous support, for their encouragement, for their friendship, their support, their advice, their energies, their time, their valuable time. Ladies and gentlemen, Jane and George Russell, who gave me the means to organize today's gathering. Please let's recognize them. We are all in your debt, Jane and George. Rarely has a speaker had an easier task than I have here today. As I greet you at this Forum of Human Solidarity, for you yourselves, all of you who are gathered here from all corners of the globe, literally, you provide the most striking example of human solidarity in action of people coming together in search of new directions to make living more happily, to make life more sustainable, to help the international community negotiate the future, negotiate ourselves out of danger and out of risk. The risk that we all know confronts us as we head towards this new millennium. Today, we're engaging in this joint search for real solutions to all those great challenges and all those grave concerns that originally gave rise to the idea of Habitat II. What is the question before us? What are the challenges? By what concepts must we engage? With what philosophies must we be animated as we together confront this 21st century for which most of us are unprepared. How do we reinforce those elements that unite human society? How do we identify and deal with, eliminate hopefully, those factors that disunite us? In this crowd, women and men of great vision, tremendous prestige and, and wisdom will help us engage that conversation that Peter Oberlander just mentioned. I am sure that today we will be contributing to building a sustainable 21st century. The United Nations is making its first small steps on this new landscape, this new landscape of bringing the spiritual dimension to bear on our cleverness our technical competence. 
our theories, our practice, this spiritual dimension is the only ingredient that can bind societies together. No matter what our technicity, our, our cleverness, our smarts, this is the message that we are sounding out for the first time in the history of the United Nations, engaging the world with a consultation, by a consultation with itself on this other dimension, the dimension of human solidarity. A few months ago, I had the privilege of conversing with Dean Morton, one of our leaders here today. And I said to him, Dean, uh, I would like you to assist me once again. He says, what do you want, Wally? I said, well, I would like you to get an interfaith group to scan all the major literature of the religions of the world, to call out of them all the statements that each faith, in its own judgment, considers relevant to the challenge of human settlements, to the challenge of creating livelihoods, to the challenge of pushing for new directions for human welfare. This is the biggest task now that I have put again at the doorstep of Dean Morton and his friends in the interfaith group. I want to announce it as a major effort underway and look forward to all of you sharing the outcome and enjoying the messages that will be contained in that great work. That is part of the pathway that we have chosen to bring into the workings of the United Nations system to bring a way of tempering, moderating the harshness of the reality of today. Competition, globalization, social exclusion, poverty, operating as if injustice were a worthy principle to be espoused for, 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 for nations, for people, for families, for individuals. This conference, Habitat II, if it has to work, will have to reject injustice, will have to reject social exclusion, we'll have to reject inequality, we'll have to build solidarity for our common human future. We are basically engaged with negotiating our survival, and you cannot do that by technique alone. You need vision, you need wisdom, you need inspiration, sagacity, you need maturity, but basically, you need passion. This is why we have this wonderful array, this wonderful group of individuals from all over the world today to help us engage that conversation. And who is going to lead and moderate this effort? One of the best, if not the best. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce Mr. Robert McNeil. Moderator par excellence, one of the gurus, if I may be consistent with this atmosphere, one of the spiritual lights of the media industry today. An old hand at Reuters was at the foundation of the effort of these big media, Reuters, NBC, BBC, and PBS. I'm privileged to call him a friend. He has decided to come and join us here to help us engage this conversation. Mr. Robert McNeil. Bob. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to be honest with you, the um, phrase human solidarity in English does not exactly electrify my soul. It is not like uh, Cyrano's Roxanne, a bell that tolls in my heart. Uh, but now that I've been forced, as a result of this exercise, to um, really focus on these words and think about them, I'm fascinated that at least in my culture, and generally the English language culture, we have for this essential human virtue no expression which has the emotive resonance of our words for other positive human qualities like courage, fairness, justice, patriotism, love, faith, loyalty, generosity, altruism, compassion, tolerance. 
It's interesting because human solidarity may really be the greatest of the virtues since it draws from all the qualities that I've just listed, qualities that have inspired poets down through the ages. I can think of only one, at least one poetic expression um, of this quality we're discussing comes to my mind, and that was when Abraham Lincoln appealed to the better angels of our nature. We all know what those angels are, and the message of Habitat is clearly that we need to mobilize those better angels. How do we, especially in the context of our um, urban future, call them forth and beat back the often stronger, darker angels of our nature? That is what this forum intends. So if the phrase in English, the English phrase human solidarity is a bit of a bare stick of a tree rhetorically, let us try to decorate it and enrich it with our thoughts here today. And we have an eminent panel to do so. On my far left is Dr. Ruth Cardoso, a uh, leading social anthropologist in Brazil and the first lady of Brazil. Ms. Beside her, uh, Mr. Charles Correa, one of the world's foremost architects who has worked on the planning for many Indian cities and uh, was the chairman of the uh, National Commission for Urban Planning. Uh, Mr. Correa. Dr. Isan Dagramachi of Turkey, uh, who's uh, the president of Bilkent University, he is a pediatrician and president of the International Association of Pediatricians. <laughs> Mr. Millard Fuller, an American businessman who 20 years ago founded the Habitat for Humanity Incorporated, which many people around the world know because of one of its uh, leading members from time to time, Jimmy Carter. Uh, and it drew the inspiration of its name from Habitat One and it drew its other inspiration from a Christian community in the state of Georgia in the United States. Uh, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> Dr. Farkonda Hassan of Egypt is a professor of geology by profession and now a member of the Egyptian parliament. Probably one of the best known people in the world, Mr. Teddy Kollek, uh, known around the world as the indomitable Teddy Kollek and the former mayor of Jerusalem. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin Ladner, president of uh, the American University in Washington, D.C., a former professor of philosophy. <laughs> Dr. Phyllis Lambert of Canada, an internationally known architect, an authority on the culture of architecture, and the founder of the Canadian Center for uh, architecture, which has drawn uh, architectural materials from all over the world in its collection. <laughs> Ms. Lambert. The Honorable Billy Miller, who is the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Barbados. <laughs> Dr. Federico Mayor of Spain, who is the D Director General of UNESCO. Uh, Mr. Ndao, Dr. Ndao is half introduced, uh, James Morton, who is Dean of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York. <laughs> Mr. Nat Nuno Amartefio of Ghana, an architect by profession and now mayor of the teeming city of Accra. Dr. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., who is an eminent American historian, both best known for his work on the Roosevelt era also very, and the New Deal, and also very well known for his role in the Kennedy White House and the chronicler of the Kennedy administration, Dr. Schlesinger. <laughs> Dr. Ishmael uh, Seregeldin of Egypt, the vice president of the World Bank. And Mr. Rajesh Tandon of India, originally an engineer, he very was very active in rural development, and he heads the organization Participatory Research Society in Asia. Mr. Tandon. 
And finally, uh, Madame, uh, Mrs. Gerald Turden, a teacher of economics and political science since 1986, a member of the Swedish Parliament, and now its deputy speaker. So, our proceedings are going to start with brief statements from each of our guests, and the simplest way to do that is in alphabetical order. So, may I invite you, uh, Dr. Cardoso, to speak to us. Thank you very much for this opportunity. But uh, as I, I read that uh, we, have, we must be provocative and spontaneous, then I decided to speak in Spanish. It's not my own language. I never deserve to use my own, uh, own language. But it's better, it's similar to my language, then I can be more spontaneous if you want. Cuando yo leí la propuesta de esta discusión, yo empecé a preguntarme qué es esto de la solidaridad. ¿Por qué otra vez estamos en esta discusión que ya parecía un poco no tan interesante. Eh, entonces, empecé a pensar que hubo en los últimos años de, de este siglo, en las tres últimas decenas, un desarrollo muy grande, y nosotros lo vivimos, lo asistimos, de la solidaridad en la, nuestras sociedades, especialmente en las sociedades urbanas, pero no, los, no solamente en ellas. Por eso me hizo acordar las mujeres. Las mujeres tuvieran un gran papel en el desarrollo de nuevas formas de solidaridad. Y fueron, quizá, no las primeras, pero de las primeras, a inventar mecanismos internacionales, mecanismos internos a ciudades e incluso mecanismos dentro de sus mismas comunidades. Eh, entonces yo dije, a lo mejor son las mujeres que están trayendo esta lesión para el mundo y por eso estamos otra vez con la cuestión de la solidaridad. Pero entonces me acordé también de los jóvenes en el 68, que justamente toda la discusión, las proposiciones, si no eran directamente sobre la solidaridad, eran claramente una crítica a la competición. Entonces ahí estamos en un campo que directamente tiene que ver con la competición, con la contestación de una competición eh, un poco sin gobierno, y por otro lado, con la construcción de redes distintas, de redes nuevas que crean la solidaridad, que fue lo que hicieran principalmente las mujeres, pero no solamente las mujeres. Y entonces todo eso me llevó a pensar qué son estos procesos de, so de, de solidaridad, y al pensar que hay procesos nuevos de solidaridad que se están desarrollando, entonces me di cuenta que nuestra discusión aquí no es solamente una discusión de nuevos valores, de cómo vamos a imponer valores a la sociedad, de cómo vamos a recuperar, porque la idea de valores tiene siempre una idea de que hay alguna cosa que está hecha, que está pronta, que se puede retomar que se puede ir a buscar en un, en un sitio donde está depositada y desarrollarla. A mí me parece que es una idea no tan rica para pensar lo que tenemos que hacer con la sociedad, porque la cultura no es un depósito donde están los valores, la cultura es un lenguaje, y un lenguaje tiene sus palabras, pero tiene lo que comunica no son las palabras, son las estructuras. Y, claro, a, a, al elegir palabras, a ir a buscar algunas más, más antiguas, otras más nuevas, y al crear nuevas, es un proceso donde la lengua se rehace. Yo creo que es eso lo que estamos haciendo, estamos tratando de pensar una nueva manera de vivir en sociedad y de vivir en las ciudades. Y tenemos los ejemplos, eso quiere decir que por supuesto ya podemos pensarlo porque ya se creó, porque la vida social ya creó este tipo de solidaridad. Pero como no tengo mucho tiempo, quiero apenas indicar para terminar que no es solo la, sociedad, la solidaridad que las ciudades modernas crearon, que grupos específicos en estas ciudades modernas crearon, pero también la violencia y el conflicto que si el famoso proceso de competición no está superado porque se inventaran redes de solidaridad, 
pero por el contrario es un gran problema en, no, en nuestras grandes ciudades. Y esto viene en paralelo, eso viene junto con el desarrollo de redes y de mecanismos de solidaridad. Entonces yo creo que para ser muy breve, breve en esta primera pro, eh, colocación, yo quiero dejar este problema de la convivencia de dos procesos sociales y que para pensar y para privilegiar lo que quiero hacer yo, privilegiar el lado de la solidaridad y de las redes de solidaridad que ya están construidas, entonces tenemos que también tratar del otro lado, que es el conflicto y la violencia que está instalado en nuestra sociedad. Muchas gracias. Pedro, so thank you very much. And now may I call upon Mr. Charles Correa of India. Well, thank you. <clears throat> you know, I think as Peter Oberland has pointed out, perhaps we pay too much attention to the physical aspects of cities and not enough to their other attributes. I would say their mythic attributes. You know, for a city can be beautiful with open spaces and trees and wide roads and yet fail to provide that particular ineffable quality of urbanity which we recognize as city. We all know examples of that. Bombay, the city I live in, of course, illustrates the very opposite. Every day it gets worse and worse as physical environment, and yet better and better as city. That is to say, every day it offers more in the way of skills, opportunities, activities, on every level, from the squatters to the college students, to the artists, to the entrepreneurs. The vitality of the theater, the newspapers, the dialogues. There are a hundred uh, examples, indications, emphasizing that impaction, implosion of energy and people, which is really a two edged sword, destroying Bombay as environment while it intensifies its quality as city. If I may say, Madame Sao Paulo is another example of that. So, what I call Bombay is great city, terrible place. <laughs> And that's what cities are about. I'd say we architects search for the city beautiful, but we opt to live in the city of Bain. Sometimes you don't have to choose, but mostly you do have to choose. Anyway, perhaps this is true of all the great metropoli in the world, except, of course, in the case of the Western ones like London or Paris, we don't really see their physical reality. We are so immersed in their mythic qualities. For instance, if you were to visit New York and had no comprehension of its myths, what would your eyes behold? A monotonous grid of traffic intersections and buildings like pigeonholes, like Cleveland, Detroit, or any, a dozen other, if I may so, say so, boring North American cities. But Fifth Avenue, Central Park, 42nd Street, the very names are magic. We do not hear them for what they really are, just planners shorthand, just numbers. Let's say 4th Avenue in Jersey City or 4th Avenue in Manila, that's nothing. But 5th Avenue in New York, that's the stuff of which dreams are made. Now, obviously this is true of the burgeoning of the new cities in the third world of Dhaka, Canton, Jakarta. What to outsiders, like any of us, may appear a mere mass of humanity spreading in all directions to infinity, to the people themselves could well be a place of unique opportunity with truly mythic dimensions. I think the Greek planner Doxiadis described this once very well. He showed a set of slides and he said, I'll tell you what urbanization is about. He said, here's a, here's a village of 250 people. And he had a slide of 250 red dots. And there was one blue dot. And he said, that's not a red person, that's a blue person. He could be Einstein, he could be the village idiot. Anyway, he's not red. Then the next slide was a village of a thousand people and now you had four or five blue dots. Then a small town of 20,000 people and in a historic moment, two blue people are meeting for the first time. And then a city of 100,000 and then you get colonies of blue people and on the edge of them, the red people are turning purple. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> and that's what cities are about, not trees, and tree-lined boulevards, but about blue people getting together, communicating, reinforcing each other, challenging and changing the red ones. Hence the Quit India movement of Mahatma Gandhi was not announced in a village in the middle of nowhere, but from Bombay. And Calcutta in its heyday was a powerhouse of ideas and reforms. 
Hence also the paradox, Bombay decaying as a physical plant, yet improving as a city, as a place where blue people meet, where things happen, where ideas incubate. And of course, as a place where urban skills grow, for the third world needs those skills. Most countries, many countries, have to import these skills. In India, as I give as an example, we have a wide spectrum of urban centers, from the smallest market towns to the largest metropoli. And they produce an incredible range of doctors, engineers, a whole lot of uh, and skills of management. So I would say, at least to me, these skills, which are an essential part of development, it seems to me that these cities of India, like the, like the farmlands of the Punjab or the coal fields of Bihar, they are a crucial part of our national wealth. And I would like, I hope, that this conference sees the positive and the incredible value of cities, of urban centers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Correa. That was fascinating. And uh, Dr. Doramachi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Charles Correa just told us that we pay too much attention to the phys physical aspects of cities and not enough to their other attributes. How true. In these few minutes allowed to me, I shall restrict my comments to one topic, and that is dignity as the essence of human solidarity. Among the shared values of humanity that generate both community bonds and social trust in a pluralistic environment, the most important one, I believe, is dignity. For there are other values equally important, such as tolerance and respect, and there are qualities that reaffirm these values, such as understanding and sympathy. But all these values and human qualities serve to improve the human condition more effectively when they are guided and informed in the first place by an overriding concern to uphold human dignity. Rapid urbanization was a major cause of degradation during Europe's industrial revolution in the middle of the last century. And it now poses a major threat to human dignity in the developing regions of our world. The pressing need for shelter has transformed large urban settlements into unsightly and often unsanitary artificial environments where human beings aspire to no more than merely surviving. In 19th century London, disease was spread among working class families who lived in dark and dark quarters because they could not afford to pay the window tax. Environmental pollution is now taking its toll in the sprawling cities of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and in the informal housing arrangement that surround and imprison these cities. Equally important is the loss of social and cultural values in these artificial environment. Not only are people alienated from their natural or traditional settings, but also from the skills, spaces, materials, and building types that have provided an appropriate and affordable physical environment, as well as a home and not merely a shelter for them. The dislocation of traditional communities and the pressure of migration in cities have moreover caused the destruction in many places of the old urban fabric, the principal cultural heritage of human creativity that has provided a sense of scale, proportion, and beauty in everyday, everyday life since the establishment of the city as the hub of human activity and exchange. It is, it is because of population density and the resulting distortion of the cultural environment that values that hold individuals and communities together fade away 
and the instinct for survival replaces concern for dignity. The challenge of the future is to enable the next generation to imagine and aspire to build for themselves and for their communities, spaces and buildings consistent with their social, cultural, and moral values, and not merely to meet their basic needs. Creativity, heightened awareness, and a rekindling of hope. In short, a commitment and determination to pursue self-improvement are the essential ingredients that will motivate the search for a better quality of life. It's not so much the planning and building of human environments by international institutions or central governments that will secure a better future for tomorrow's communities. Instead, the key to future development of self-sustaining and vibrant communities lies in the guiding and encouraging of people to build for themselves using their own resources and their own imagination. This will serve them to liberate themselves from the debilitating dependency on external aid and enable them to achieve the confidence and dignity deriving from shaping one's own environment. Human solidarity, the notion of civil society conceived on the global scale, brings with it a vision for meeting future challenges in a world where resources must be created anew and not simply transferred from elsewhere. What is transferable efficiently and effectively are ideas and skills, thanks to the major technological advancement of this decade, namely information technology. Human solidarity as an idea or as a movement alone cannot be expected to bridge the gap between human needs and sustainable human environments. It can do so only when it is coherently defined, communicated, and understood. It can be an effective means, moreover, to help communities to take their destiny into their own hands by, by raising awareness of the environment and showing the means for sustained improvement. The overriding goal in marshalling information technology today must be that of engaging human beings in the planning and creation of culturally appropriate environments that foster a spirit of community while responding to the essential needs of upholding individual choice and freedom. The concurrent development of the public and private space, the space for freedom and the space for exchange is essential to create a sense of belonging and sense of self-confidence that civic responsibility and individual liberty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Now, Mr. Millard Fuller. Great. We have heard uh, this morning from Dr. Cardozo that we need a new way of living uh, to achieve human solidarity. And uh, Mr. Correa has spoken about his native uh, Bombay being a wonderful city and a terrible place. Um, and uh, Dr. Dogmasi has spoken of dignity. And all of these are elements that are needed if we're going to achieve uh, human solidarity. Uh, when Jesus uh, launched his uh, ministry 2,000 years ago, he said, we must repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in English, that uh, sort of connotes feeling sorry for getting caught. But uh, in the Greek, uh, we read that what he really said was to metanoite. Uh, metamorphosis is what a butterfly becomes after it metamorphoses out of being a little fuzzy caterpillar. Metanoite ingikin gahabasalaya tona renon. Change your whole way of thinking because the new order of the spirit is confronting you and challenging you. And we have a very sobering uh, situation confronting us today, and I think the only way we will deal with it successfully and the only way we will achieve human solidarity uh, in dealing with this uh, situation which confronts us is to have a completely new way of thinking. 
But the question is, how do you achieve a new way of thinking about old problems, intransigent problems, problems that seem to get worse? Uh, as Mr. Correa said in his Bombay, and that situation exists around the world. I think more people change their thinking uh, through acting. Uh, more people act themselves into a new way of thinking rather than thinking themselves into a new way of acting. And in our work uh, with Habitat for Humanity, we are giving people an opportunity to act themselves into a new way of thinking. It was mentioned in introducing me uh, by Mr. McNeil earlier that uh, our most famous volunteer in Habitat for Humanity is former President Jimmy Carter. Uh, he has said to me on numerous occasions that he has learned more about the poor and he has gained deeper understanding about the plight of the poor and the real situation that they confront through his work with Habitat for Humanity because in his work with us, he goes out with his wife Rosalind and with many, many other people and we live with the people in the poor neighborhoods. We become friends with these people. We understand the problems from their perspectives and from their points of view. And that gains us uh, a real deep insight in what needs to be done to make things better for everyone. Uh, President uh, Bill Clinton, uh, the current President of the United States, came out when he was campaigning in 1992 and spent a day building a house for a very low-income family in Atlanta, Georgia. This particular family was a family that had been uh, a loser in everything, a loser in marriage, a loser in jobs, a loser in economics, a loser in housing. Uh, but he helped to build that house, and then uh, when he was elected president, uh, invited this single mother to come to Washington to attend the inauguration and to be a full participant in the inauguration when he became president. About 18 months later, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution newspaper ran a full-page story about the transformation that had, that had occurred in this woman. She was now a community leader. She had a self-image, a good feeling about herself, and because of that had totally transformed her life. So when we engage ourselves in the problems of those on the margins of society and gain understanding, we enable them and ourselves to have this solidarity which must be achieved uh, in order to change things for the better. I think the challenge before us is to have wonderful cities and wonderful places, not wonderful cities and terrible places. You cannot have human solidarity with half the population living an affluent life, going to the theater, being able to frequent the museums, but the other half living in misery. It's not necessary, and if we work together, things can be changed for the better. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Dr. Hassan, please. Thank you, Mr. McNeil. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we all respect the people's right to live a healthy and productive life in an adequate human settlement, and we all share the hope that a new world can be built in which sustainable development can be realized. Sustainable development puts the people at the center of its concerns, and it can only be realized through their solidarity and cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, the alarming increase in the level of urbanization brings about a divergence of lifestyles, values and aspirations that are manifested in a mosaic of little worlds which touch but do not interpenetrate, a situation that weakens social consensus and cohesion. Population pressures cause significant environmental degradation. Such degradation is usually caused by poverty in the South and affluence in the North. The psychological roots of man's behavior and attitude towards nature are found in the common perception of the self as I. As a result, we think of ourselves as apart from nature, not a part of it. Such mentality creates a low synergy society whose parts tend to function against the benefit of the whole. Building a high synergy society or sustainable mentality will require changes in technology, industry, political institutions, housing, transportation, as well as a fundamental change in our ethics. 
adopting sustainable ethics helps creating a sustainable society. Investing in human development is important in this respect. Skilled and knowledgeable people are in better position to make the transition to a sustainable society and to bring the development of urban areas and the overall system of settlements to harmony with the natural environment. Human solidarity is based on shared values and involves some special quality and level of presumptive mutual trust, loyalty, and faith. It arises out of interactions in which people bear collective responsibility and develop strategies to take collective actions towards shared goals. Human solidarity appears to be determined and strengthened by a number of variables that can be explored by evaluating the response of the people to social organization and increased discipline, and the extent of the control of the social organizations of a resource allocation and involvement in the design and implementation uh, of local development projects. Most of those variables are based on one main indicator, which is the structural characteristic of the place of people's living. Of course, culture and context are crucial influence on the different facets of human solidarity. The degree of human solidarity depends to a great extent on the conditions under which people are. Some conditions generate shared interests and common goals that motivate solidarity and increased sense of commitment. One of the most important determinants of greater solidarity is hazardous conditions. Some other conditions decrease solidarity and might destroy it completely. These include conditions of increasing poverty and disparities in the quality of human life, and I agree with uh, Mr. Fuller here. The widening disparities of income and wealth within nations and among nations are seen to be the basic mechanisms of segregation and the centrifugal forces that reduce solidarity and collectivity. Our greatest challenge, ladies and gentlemen, in promoting socially viable human settlements is not just fostering social cohesion or building a culture of cooperation, but to scrutinize the social, economic, environmental, and political processes that put people in such conditions of social disintegration. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to end up my presentation by sharing with you some of the concerns from the perspective of an inhabitant of the third world. How can we promote universal human solidarity while we, the people of the South, are not sure about our food security under the new GATT and the World Trade Organization? Who makes the rules? Who decides where the money goes? How fair is the decision-making of the World Bank and other development banks? Who owns the knowledge? Who owns the earth? I leave you with these questions and I thank you. Thank you very much. And now Teddy Kollek. You have to push your, push your button there. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I come from a very complicated city, from Jerusalem. The content uh, of the name, both in Arabic and Hebrew, is the city of peace. But it's a city that has very rarely had peaceful periods. But uh, there is one astonishing uh, thing to say. We have at the moment an exhibition of uh, projects of uh, uh, models of old cities that existed 3,000 years ago at the time when David the King made Jerusalem his capital. All famous great cities, Babylon, Nineveh, Ur, many others. Seven all together are depicted there. None of them exists. And here a small city with no resources, no harbors, no rivers, no great resources, uh, continues to exist now for all these thousands of years, a few thousand years before David, 
and 3,000 years since David the King, and it still continues to exist. It, I can't find an, uh, an explanation. People who are deeply religious find an easy uh, answer. If you ask yourself from a purely logical point of view, it's more difficult to find an answer. But we live there and we try to achieve that peaceful situation that has not been achieved all through these periods. Now, we're living in a period where cities become more and more important and where they have a major, a greater and greater part of the population. Uh, and where they are suddenly, from homogeneous cities, very often become mixed cities. We are here in the largest Turkish city. The second largest Turkish city is Berlin. <laughs> and uh, it's full of problems. When they first, as guest workers, came there, they were supposed, after a little while, to go back home. They didn't want to go home. Even when the uh, German parliament allocated a large financial advance for all those who would go back, uh, they decided to stay. They brought their teachers there, they brought their imams there, they built their mosques there, and you have now 350,000 Turks living in Berlin, and from a homogeneous city, it has become a mixed city. Another example of Berlin, when we, if we are already at it, here it was a divided city for a comparatively short time, and these two, when the wall broke down, everybody thought on both sides, Germans and both sides, Christians, how easy it will be for them to live together. And it turns out that even these few decades of different psychology have produced different thinking, and it's not at all easy to bring them together again. So cities are very complicated uh, uh, organizations, and more and more people living in them, the uh, greater part of the world population living in them won't make it easier. You have to cry and create shared values in cities. That is the object uh, and the only way of making them uh, live together. <clears throat> and it's made more difficult uh, because of modern techniques. The fact that you have today uh, facts and you want a reply within the minute you send the question, before that you could write a letter for her which would go there for a few days and then come back for a few days and you could think about matters, no such chance anymore. Uh, the, uh, moreover, you had leaders before. I remember I have a ripe age, so I remember the fireside chats of uh, President Roosevelt, how people were sitting together once in a while and listening to it. Now you see the President of the United States 17 times a day in your bathroom, in your bedroom or so. <laughs> how can you keep respect? How can you keep respect towards leaders when you see them all the time? So the element of leadership, which is a very important element in building a society, has disappeared. And uh, with all this, we have to build uh, better cities. And uh, I join uh, the doubts about uh, Bombay, where you have a, which is supposed to be, as we heard here, a terrible city, but a very good place to live in. I think people want equality. And uh, the nearness of the television and the nearness of leadership and the nearness of everything makes equality very touchable. You know of it. It's not something that is far away and about which you can tell stories that don't exist. I don't believe in cities becoming melting pots. I think what they should be are mosaics. Groups with their own <coughs> culture and with their own background living together and uh, living in good relationship to their nearest neighbors. I think that's achievable, that has been achieved, not always. 
not in Canada at the moment, but uh, in many places it has been achieved, and it, this is a target which is manageable. And I think this is a target we should set ourselves. And you have to do it by various ways. By schools, of course, and by education, of course, but also by people joining, walking in the same park. You walk in the same park, you uh, work in the same uh, factory or in the same workplace, and gradually you get accustomed to each other and you rub shoulders, and then maybe you go home to your own district and where you have your own culture and where you have your own sentiments, but in the end you could live with the other in a reasonable uh, situation. Uh, let me end uh, by a quotation uh, that I picked up by mere chance of Bertrand Russell, who said uh, uh, something about public morality and space. And he said, without civic morality, communities perish. But without personal morality, their survival has no value. Thank you very much. And now, Dr. Ladner. However obvious it seems to remark upon it, any approach to the issues of habitation and human settlements must in the end make sense. Therefore, we must become self-conscious about what I will call conceptual habitation. That is, the contours of our imaginative dwellings, where our hearts and souls bed down with the expectation that Upon waking each day, our lives can be so arrayed that our deepest sense of ourselves can find a harmonious fit with the contours of our surroundings. Because of the urgency of meeting the physical and social needs that are associated with global habitation, we are tempted to dismiss efforts to reconceptualize such needs as being merely a theoretical matter. I would argue, however, that our primary task, especially in such deliberations as these, is to create a compelling, humane image of the human community that can be believed and embraced by all human beings. The fact is, we can do only what we can first imagine. The sociologist Charles Horton Cooley once wrote, the imaginations we have of one another are the solid facts of society. In addition to our physical habitations, all of us live inside images we have of ourselves, our neighbors, our enemies, our world. To change or harmonize these images is a much larger issue than that of simply formulating a new policy for approaching immediate so-called practical solutions. Our actions always intermingle with and reflect our beliefs. Simply stated, this means that if we are to make permanent inroads into the growing problems of habitation, we must face up to the inescapable educational challenge inherent in such problems. It follows that first, we must make a huge, uncompromising investment in the world's children. And second, we must make systematic efforts to generate understanding, which is another word for education, the overriding public responsibility of every society. The pivotal link between ourselves and others is understanding. There are unavoidable events that constitute the shared experience of all people, birth, hunger, pain, passion, fear, love, death. Now, as in every age, there are new challenges for understanding in the areas of science, technology, finance, politics, business, literature, and so on. However, the central challenge for understanding in our time is the challenge of understanding ourselves and each other. The actions we engage in flow from the imaginal frameworks that empower us to address, to act, to forgive, and to do the things we do on an ordinary day. The dominating image, now fragmented and confused, that we must begin to understand and clarify 
is the image of persons. We have systematically destroyed more of our fellow human beings in this century than in all previous centuries combined. We have been able to do this because we have been unable to affirm a compelling image of the irreducible value of persons. Yet, what we have most in common is each other. So long as we define the other, whether other ideas, other people, or other cultures, as strange or threatening, merely because they do not fit our beliefs, images, or ideologies, we will have missed the opportunity to change and to bind ourselves to the human community, which is what genuine understanding requires. Understanding is also the leverage point of empowerment. Knowing what matters most and what holds the human community together is the precondition for improving the condition of human settlements. Human settlements that do not become communities of mutual understanding and respect will always be, in the deepest sense, unsettled. The bonds of community are shared values, and the root of these values is the mystery of the unavoidable events of human experience. The architecture of habitation in human settlements must be aligned with the architecture of the human spirit. The mismatch of these two architectures has left us increasingly fearful as racially, economically, and religiously diverse nations and neighborhoods inevitably impinge upon each other. Despite our technological, economic, political, and social expertise, we really have not learned yet how to negotiate sharply contrasting worldviews, those deeply held assumptions about the nature of reality. Because education is more than gaining information or expertise and involves cultivating the human spirit, we must commit ourselves to the difficult work of imaging our common humanity, especially to our children, of building porous architectural structures that invite the free flow of human interactions that lead to understanding, and of enacting civic rituals that resonate with the music of our ancestors and of our own souls, whose harmony is the perfect pitch of peace. Thank you very much. Just uh, so you know, I'm going to take one more opening statement, then we're going to have a short uh, coffee break, and uh, then we'll resume afterwards. So now, uh, Dr. Phyllis Lambert, please. I wish to address... Oh, there we are. Thank you. I wish to address patrimony and the city, developing enab enabling strategies, empowering people. Habitat 2 is showing the way in bring, bringing together individuals and organizations that are not part of government. It has been shown consistently that, the on that only through the wisdom of individual citizens acting in consultation and not, pat not in paternalism can the difficult issues of governance and the economy interrelated with cons concerns of community, the environment, and culture be successfully advanced. I will uh, briefly talk about the citizens' movement, governance, and culture. The citizens' movement in the last 25 years has seen the growth of an increasingly complex network of interventions in patrimonial issues in education and housing and urban form responsive to citizens. Intervention has been based on radical theory of social and physical preservation new social and economic structures for low-income housing, and new planning practices that affect the environment. From these developing practices have grown new cultural institutions that heighten understanding and bring about thoughtful action. We must build step by step. Success breeds success. The citizens' movement, initially concerned with tenants' rights, challenged the notion of property rights and the relationship between private and public. Above all in importance, however, has been the development of the structures of not-for-profit cooperative housing corporations. 
Corporate, cor cooperative housing has proved a major tool for preserving housing stock. It has done so, it has done much more by creating community, cooperation and solidarity through the need of interaction. The enabling mechanisms of cooperative housing have empowered those without an effective voice, giving them access to good housing in the city and skills whereby, whereby they may use cooperative structures to achieve self-governance. The maintenance of buildings and neighborhoods is also ensured by common agreements on property use. Through the innovative use of legal structures, uh, properties can be removed from the market and the tenant owners thus protected from speculation and, evict and eviction which has been the bane of our cities. The renewal of housing stock by housing cooperatives and neighborhoods and non-profit organizations has allowed low-income families access to property, ownership, and involvement in their community. These activities have also provided managed housing units for the elderly, furthered education, health, and economic development, the integration of immigrants, and have significantly lowered the crime rate in, in cities. Stopping degradation at a micro level operates at a macro level, incrementally stabilizing areas of the city and preserving its patrimony. These activities inevitably affect urban form and the environment. Irreplaceable neighborhoods and structures are maintained in the city. Preservation encourages labor-intensive renovation rather than the economically and ecologically wasteful process of demolition followed by new construction. Keeping lower income workers in the city through affordable, affordable housing assures the diversity of population on the one hand, and on the other, discourages the need for new highways and reduces traffic pollution. Furthermore, the skills people develop by participating in cooperative housing organizations also gives them confidence in their ability to intervene in the planning process from protest to public uh, hearings, affecting continuity and change in the city as a whole. On the level of governance, citizens must demand and obtain direct and open channels of communication linking community groups and citizens with government to ensure that they will have an active role in the decision-making process. Properly cons uh, cons constituted public consultation in which all voices are heard and questioned in an open forum with the proceedings recorded, synthesized, and published is one of the most powerful mechanisms for doing so. It assures consensus and leads to the decisions that will work and be sustained. Experience has shown that citizens have proved to be much better planners than bureaucrats that do not work in partnerships with citizens. The process of public consultation must be recognized legally as in an, an, in an, in an inalienable right. Cultural issues. As a result of the preservation movement, people have an awareness of the historical significance of their built environment, and they are active in preserving what would have been torn down 40 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. If we do not preserve architectural history, we have nothing to pass on to future generations and lose the symbols, because these buildings are symbols, the symbols that bind us. The preservation movement has spawned institutions that act both tangibly and intellectually and spiritually. The International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, for example, ECROM in Rome, university programs in con conservation and on the history and theory of architecture and architectural uh, museums projecting values. All of these have been developed in the last half century. And they have, through consistent educational programs, uh, through uh, including exhibitions, publications, workshops, colloquia, and even good tours of cities, intensified an understanding of the importance of cities to the quality of life and for human solidarity. Through citizen action in the formation of new organizations and institutions, through participation in decision making, and through new educational programs, people learn to believe in their own abilities and become part of a global group of communities 
effecting change. However, advancement is not continuous. The means of transmitting and exchanging literature and information on enabling mechanisms for empowering people must be improved. An international network like that created by Amnesty International is needed to be aimed at broadcasting best practices, transferring skills, acting to stop abuses, and will enhance human solidarity in cities throughout the world and build sustainable human and physical structures dedicated to peace and to social justice. Thank you very much. Let us now take a 15-minute uh, break and back no later than 11.30, which is if, gives you a few minutes leeway. Thank you.